Hello and welcome to the Situation Report. Glad to have you with us today. Looking forward to an incredible conversation and you will be happy you jumped into this conversation with us. This is, of course, the show where we give you the information you need to navigate an ever-changing culture. My name is Jeremy Stolnicker here with Chad Robichaux. And uh, today is a, a conversation, again, that you're gonna be so glad that you participated in. If you're listening, thank you for listening. If you're not watching, take some time after this, wherever you're listening from, go to Salem now. You can watch the video of this. Uh, so often on this show, when we talk about navigating an ever-changing culture, we talk about the role of media. Media is so pervasive in our American culture, of course. We talk about media bias, and often as we have these conversations, uh, at least from my perspective, there is a lack of hope. <laughs> it seems like we're being overrun. There is no hope, but there is. And I'm thankful that indeed there is hope and thankful for our guest today that will help break this down for us and give us the direction, the insight, and the perspective that we so desperately need. Our guest today is someone who needs very little introduction for our audience. We have the pleasure today of having with us Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Uh, Dr. Gorka, thank you so much for your time. Really, really honored to have you on. Guys, don't mention it. It's a distinct honor for me to be on with you guys. Thank you for everything you'll do. you've done for this nation and everything you're doing uh, right now, especially for our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So thank you, guys. Just one thing. Uh, I got to tell you, it would be much sexier if the show was called Sit Rep. Just a little, <laughs> little real comment, okay? Well, we refer to it as Sit Rep, but not everyone knows what that is. You'd be amazed how many times I've said Sit Rep, and people are like, "What in the world is that? What does that even mean, Sit Rep?" So we have to go back and explain it. I get it. That's what we call it, though. Yeah, for sure. You're absolutely right, though. And uh, we always go for the sexier title. There's no question about that. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Gorka, you are the former Deputy Assistant for Strategy to the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, he, um, the host of America First, a nationally syndicated radio show on Salem Radio Network, which is where we are as well, and the Gorka Reality Check on Newsmax TV. You are a New York Times bestselling author. Your current book, The War for America's Soul, is something that we'll talk about later on in the show. Uh, you have such a diverse background. You've been involved in so many different areas of uh, policy, administration, and now in the media. Uh, and, and a lot of folks know who you are, certainly on this network. A lot of people are very familiar with you. For those that may not know your story or your journey, uh, could you just give us a thumbnail of that? Talk to us about where you came from and, and really specifically how you ended up in, in this arena where you're talking about conservative ideals and philosophies and principles and uh, really pushing these things forward for us. Yeah, absolutely. So in a nutshell, my parents um, suffered as children under Nazi occupation. Uh, they grew up, they were born in Hungary. Then after the end of World War II, uh, they suffered the communist takeover of, of their country. My father, a, a, a devout Catholic, decided to resist in college, he created a secret underground group of uh, patriots, of students, to resist the communist takeover. He was betrayed by one of the greatest traitors of uh, the Cold War, Kim Philby. He was arrested, tortured, and imprisoned, got a life sentence at the age of 20 in a communist uh, prison. Uh, six years later, after two years in solitary, two years down a prison coal mine, and then two years in a political prison, he was liberated by the amazing freedom fighters of the 1956 uh, revolution in Hungary. And with the 17-year-old daughter of a fellow prison mate, they escaped across the minefields into Austria, became real refugees, ended up in the UK, were married, and those were my parents. I was wow. born and raised in the UK to exiles from communist Hungary. Um, I joined the British uh, reserves, the uh, British Territorial Army. I was in an MI unit. My MOS was an interrogator. Did that for a few years, and then the wall fell. I spoke Hungarian. I'd served in the NATO army, so I decided to move to the land of my parents' birth, and I spent five years in the Hungarian Defense Ministry helping that post-communist country get back into the West and join NATO. Lived there for 15 years, met my American wife in Europe, started working for the DOD out of Germany. There's a beautiful place called the Marshall Center in Garmisch-Partenkirchen where we train our FAOs. I started uh, teaching 
and a, a, for an amazing guy, a, mar a Marine. He, we've lost him too, too, too soon. His name was Nick Pratt. He was a legend in the, uh, the uh, Marine Corps and also in the uh, paramilitaries uh, in the CIA. He was in Afghanistan in the 80s. I was on his faculty teaching counterterrorism and IW um, after 9-11 to our allies across the globe. That opened some doors for me. And then in 2008, my American wife and I said, it's time to go to the center of the universe. I applied for a job at West Point, at VMI, and at NDU. And I was given a professorship at National Defense University, came across the pond, and I taught counterterrorism for five years in, as a DOD civilian. Then two and a half years at the Marine Corps University, I was the uh, chair for military theory. And I'd written a book. My first book was Defeating Jihad. Hmm. on how to understand al-Qaeda, how to understand groups like ISIS. <clears throat> Somebody called Donald Trump saw the book. I got a <laughs> phone call summer of 2015 from a guy called Corey Lewandowski. had no idea who he was. <laughs> Corey said, hey, Mr. Trump needs somebody to advise him on national security issues for the next debate. Do you want to come meet him? So I took a plane to New York, met this amazing guy, sat across a table for him for about 40 minutes, halfway through the meeting, classic Trump, stops the conversation dead, looks at Corey and says, I like this guy, let's hire him. <laughs> so, um, so I became an advisor to, to candidate Trump and then uh, we won the election and I ended up as strategist to the president, deputy assistant to the president in the White House, uh, mostly national security stuff, CT, defeat ISIS, stuff like that. Yeah, I've always just been fascinated by your, by your story and what you do and, and I was you know, super privileged to be on your show just recently. And uh, so with such a diverse background and, you know, in news and media, uh, at some point you had to make a deliberate decision to focus on conservative content. Yeah. Uh, so what, what was your motivation that said, this is what I have to do. I take all my experience in life and just focus on, focus on conservative content in America. Yeah, I, I didn't even mention you know, the media. So I started doing, Fox picked me up after the Paris attacks and I started doing hits on Fox. Then after I left the administration, Salem, the amazing Phil Boyce, who discovered everybody, Hannity, Levin, you name it. I met him at a, at a party in uh, D.C. and he said, hey, have you ever thought about doing radio? And I thought, are you serious? I mean, I've been, I've been listening to talk radio since I was about eight. And then you have the accent. I mean, you sound... Your accent just makes you sound smart. So like, you've got, you got, you got to work on the accent. The, the accent helps. And then they offered me this national show, and I love it. I mean, I've always been a consumer of conservative media, and now to be on the other side of the mic is amazing. But your question is the right question. So th there is an actual moment in time when I realized I've got to do something. And it was, so I'd been advising President Trump in the background during the, during the you know, debates um, in, in 15. And then... Um, in 16, I was teaching at the Marine Corps and I looked at the last two candidates. I looked at the guy I was advising, who wasn't my style, let's be clear. I grew up in the UK, stiff upper lip, debate club and all that. You know, I, I, I'm not used to the kid from Queen style. But then I, I looked at him and his absolute detestation of political correctness. And I looked at Hillary Clinton truly evil incarnate one of the most corrupt politicians in western history and i thought guys this is it we, we are on the precipice for the republic and i made a decision and i started i i, I remember i was in a car park i was go, i was going to some meeting and i was in a car park and i thought god this is so serious i got my phone out and i did a 50 second video on why you can't vote for hillary clinton i don't care who you are what your background is but this woman is so corrupt whether you like his style or not the republic is on the edge of a cliff you've got to vote for president trump so i came, came out of the, of the closet i guess um and that was my first political statement then i got to know mike flynn at various trump rallies and then i said okay let's go full hog and, and uh, tweeting and facebook and you name it and and that's when i realized the only part of society we own guys the only part of society conservatives own is talk radio, is, is our pushing back on the censored social media. So it's, it's time to get serious. So that's why I took that decision when I took it. When you were talking about Phil Boyce discovering these incredible personalities, you forgot to mention the host yeah. of the Situation Report. So I'll just throw that out there. He's, he's, also, 
he's also discovered us, and we're pretty close to the top of the list. But <laughs> anyhow, continuing with with for our me, conversation. Me, you guys, you guys aren't media personalities. You're serious men. There is a difference when when you are saving thousands of our allies, our partners, our brothers in Christ from Afghanistan. I would not insult you to call you media personalities. <laughs> It's like, it's like when I was a professor for years and years and years, if anybody called me an academic, I, I told them, I resent that remark. I am not an <laughs> academic. Thank you. Yeah. I agree with you. I don't see myself as a, media, as a media person. I just like to communicate the things that we're involved in. Hey, dude, the, 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 the pins on your lapel tell everyone you're not a media person. I wanted to take a minute to let our audience know about the work that we do through an incredible veterans nonprofit called the Mighty Oaks Foundation. Many of our nation's warriors struggle with the hardships of military service and reintegration back into civilian life. Often they leave broken homes in their aftermath and comprise one of the most at-risk groups for suicide, with over 20 veterans who take their lives every single day. Mighty Oaks tackles this critical issue with our faith-based peer-to-peer resiliency and recovery programs offered at no cost to our honored servicemen and women at beautiful ranches across the United States. Mighty Oaks has one of the highest success rates of any program available anywhere. Visit MightyOaksPrograms.org to learn more about how you can make a direct impact in the lives of our service men and women to help them find a new life purpose through hope in Christ. Again, that's MightyOaksPrograms.org. Witnessing the transformation that these men and women go through is absolutely incredible. There are no words to describe seeing warriors restored to the lives they were created to live, changing their legacies for eternity. Your support is needed now more than ever and will ensure that our programs are here for our warriors who are in desperate need. Again, the website is mightyoaksprograms.org. When we uh, when we do talk about media and uh, you know, it is such an important aspect of American culture, I, I, culture around the world, I'm sure, but certainly American culture. Uh, often people will say something like this, we need people to report the news, we need reporters to report the news, we don't need their bias. Yeah. And conservative media has a built-in bias, left media has a built-in bias as well. Do you see that as being in conflict with what we call news, or is that built-in bias something that's necessary or something that is separate from just news reporting? Well, look, let's, let's be realistic, it doesn't matter what country you're in, at the moment, this wasn't the case 60 years ago. 60 years ago, there was a, a multiplicity of political identities in newsrooms. But today, in the 21st century, it, it, you can look at the voting stats. 93% of, of journalists are registered Democrats or vote Democrat. Right. There are some journalists, real honorable people like John Solomon and others, who say, I do not vote. I am a journalist. My job is to cover the news. Therefore, mm. I'm not even going to vote. That that is like you know there's like six of them left in America, right? You know Sarah Carter, John Solomon, Greg Jarrett. Um, so so the culture of media is left wing. Like the culture until recently, until everything went woke, the culture of business was conservative. You want right. to be an entrepreneur, you want to risk, you want to build something. That's usually a conservative thing. If you want to be a school teacher or a journalist, it's kind of a default setting. But here's the issue: what we have in America is not bias that's uh, obvious. It's, it's the fact that the New York Times is a mouthpiece of the Democrat Party, but they say that they're independent. Right. They say that they are unbiased. Right. You know, I, I don't hide the fact that I'm a conservative. Every, you ch tune into my radio show within 30, 30 nanoseconds, you'll know what I believe. Because I tell you, I'm a right. conservative. <laughs> right. I grew up under Maggie Thatcher. Ronald Reagan is a hero for me. I don't pretend to be unbiased and then spin it. Right. But except for MSNBC, when you know, Rachel Maddow says, yeah, I'm a crazy leftist, these people say that they are actually independent. The Washington Post, CNN, the New York Times say, we're journalists when they're pumping out propaganda. I mean, when Jim Acosta, that pathetic man who's even dis, you know, ashamed of his Hispanic heritage, because mm. Jim, your name is Abilio. You weren't born Jim. Your birth certificate says Abilio, so I'm not sure why he's ashamed of his Hispanic heritage. When he is given a show after being the senior White House correspondent, he's given a show now on CNN, and he attacks the most popular podcaster in the world, 
Joe Rogan by saying he's taking horse dewormer. Right. Right. Hang on a second. I took ivermectin. Ivermectin is a human drug, like many human drugs, is also used for animals. Guess what? Doxycycline, the most popular antibiotic, is used for, for dogs and cats. Hmm. Do we call doxycycline a cat medicine? Of course <laughs> not. But when CNN attacks Joe Rogan, because Joe Rogan's got literally 200 times the audience of CNN, right. when they say, hey, we're unbiased journalists and he's taking horse dewormer, they're not journalists. I mean, this is what everybody has to understand. These, when I'm in the White House, and for political reasons, I get it, I'm attacked every single day, but when they attack my wife, when they attack my 18-year-old son using words like traitor in a headline, mm. you don't get to call yourself a journalist. You're a hack, you're a mouthpiece, you're a propagandist. So the issue isn't bias in media, it's those who are biased who pretend that they're not biased. Right, very good. One of the, the questions that was in our last election cycle that was highlighted was, what's, what is the role of media in the United States? And so if you had to define the role of a Christian media in the United States, you know, not, not just conservative media, but Christian media, we're in Salem right now, what, what would that be? Well, first things first, uh, I think it was Adams or, or, or Madison. America, America only functions, the Constitutional Republic of America only functions if the people in America have Christian values. You don't have to be a Christian, okay? We have separation of church and state. But the people who founded this nation understand that truth is real. Beauty is real. Truth exists outside mm -hmm. of human beings. And it comes from the fact that we are made in the image of our creator. So first things first, um, the role of the media is to cleave to the truth and to uncover corruption. That's its job, whether from the right or the left. And don't get me wrong, I'm no fa I'm, I may have worked in a, a Republican White House, but I'm no fan of the GOP. I, I said it when I was in the White House. I've said it since I've left the White House. Donald Trump won the presidency despite the GOP, not mm. thanks to the GOP. So, you know, the job should be, I mean, the fifth estate's job, a, a, a vibrant republic should have a functioning media that roots out corruption and talks about it, whoever's in, 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 in power, but not to lie about Russian collusion for four years and allow the former uh, director of the CIA to call the president a Russian asset and a traitor on cable television. I mean, that, that's not the media, that is literally, you know, North Korean style propaganda. Now, what's the right role of Christian media? It's the same as what's the role of Christians. And this is the one thing I've come to realize in the last 18 months in America under COVID, under the China virus. And it saddens me as somebody who chose this nation, wasn't blessed to be born here, but chose this nation as, as a legal immigrant. Where's the courage gone? I mean, ne never, never in the history of medicine have we quarantined healthy people no. We, we've never done that. You quarantine sick people. Never in the history of America have we voluntarily closed down the economy and destroyed the jobs of 44 million people and hundreds of thousands of businesses. And the fact that it was, you know, one bar owner in New Jersey, one restaurant owner in California that said, no, I'm not shutting down. Guys, it should have been everybody. Everybody in America that has a business should have said, the government doesn't have a right to take away my livelihood from me and make it impossible for me to not only feed my children, but pay my busboy to pay the guy that cooks, you know, the, the, the burgers at my diner. So, you know, the role of all Christians, not just Christian media, is to never censor yourself and never kneel at the altar of falsehood and, and propaganda. So guys, my job every day, your job is to simply, and all of us Americans, is to propagate the truth that we know is real and connected to our creator. What is, in, in your view, the future of conservative media in the US? We're, we're coming, I'm, I'm in California, uh, Chad is in DC right now, but lives in Texas, so we come from kind of two politically yeah. uh, opposed uh, states. Um, this is, as we're recording, the day after a recall election that went horribly the wrong direction in my, in my view. And a big part of that, I think, is media in, this, in the state 
probably media across the country. What's the future of conservative media, and do you think that the voice of conservative media will continue to help, or it feels like we are, you know, as the Bible talks about, one uh, crying in the wilderness. It, it feels that way very much on the conservative side and yeah. in conservative media. What, what is the future as we look down the road? Look, uh, I, 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 I've never had more listeners than I've had um, since I started the show. Uh, we may have a demented, senile old man who, you know, <laughs> surrendered in, in, in Afghanistan and who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, has literally committed treason with right. the Chinese military. Right. But I have three million listeners. I, I'm one of the newest radio shows in America. See, let's stop here. Can we just stop and talk about reality? I only realized this when I was in the White House and they were booking me for media hits. Do you know what the audience of CNN is? On a good night, on a good night, CNN gets 500,000 viewers. Mm. We, we, we shouldn't even talk about CNN. Yeah. I have three million listeners. And that's without yeah. my Newsmax TV show. That's without my podcast. So that, you know, there are people there who are hungry and we have to feed them. I'm a little bit leery of creating um, these conservative ghettos. Yes, you know, we are being shadow banned like crazy. I've been terminated twice on YouTube. My Twitter account, my Facebook account, you know, of course they're censoring us. But the idea that the solution is to create, you know, the ghetter, parlor, rumble ghetto. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a force multiplier. That's another weapon in our duty belt. But, but we have to be on the battlefield of the left and fight, right. fight, fight. Right. And, 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 and on top of that, we have to, you know, we need leadership on Capitol Hill. You, we've got to strip them of their, their 230 immunity. We, we, we've got to break up uh, big tech. And, 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 and then just create a flourishing of a new media environment. So keep fighting, guys. And, and all the listeners, you've got to support conservative media. Uh, one of the, I learned this from Dennis Prager, a good friend. I, you know, I'm a Catholic, but I call him my rabbi. Wherever we are, <laughs> wherever we're speaking, I was with Dennis in California on Saturday. He always says, we're in front of 1,400 people in LA, he says, if you want the truth, if you want to listen to my show, to Seb's show, You've got to support the businesses that make it possible. We don't get half a billion dollars from the taxpayer like NPR does. Right. We are free enterprise. So if you want the truth, you've got, you've got to buy Mike Lindell's pillow. You, you've got to buy Relief Factor. You, you, you've got to support those that make our shows possible because that's what free enterprise and what freedom is all about. So I'm not worried because look, we will we've already won we, we won you know two thousand years ago on on golgotha right, right our lord and savior took his took our sins upon himself we've already won so mm. guys chill okay but we have to fight here for the truth and we will be victorious why 73 million americans voted for donald trump and my old boss i guarantee you right now he's coming back in 2024 yeah, he's pretty much all but said it. Yeah, I, I, got, a, I got a funny story for you uh, with talking about shadow banning and censoring. Yesterday, um, my counterpart and Save Our Allies, uh, Sarah Verardo, uh, had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, General Milley uh, about you know, obviously we, you know, we know how we feel about General Milley, but to continue doing what we're doing, we have to work with the military. So we had this uh, meeting with him, and I had to I, I had to post one of the things which was. Hey, we had a meeting with the Joint Chiefs, and uh, it, and so it was actually a positive towards him. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, crediting him or anything. We did, we had a meeting with him. Right. And Twitter would not let that four times. They just deleted the post every time because they're assuming I'm saying something negative. Wow. How about this? How, how <laughs> I was about, actually throwing him a bone. <laughs> I mean, how about this? This is look. Let let me let me give you my personal example. So I'm a huge gun guy. I, I have two serious diseases. I can't go past the bookstore without buying a book and I can't go past the gun store without buying a gun. And I like to, I like to post about my guns. And I got an amazing uh, AR pistol from Springfield. And I did a little video of me pulling it out of the bag, assembling it, and, and I posted it on Instagram. As soon as I post, this is, this is me next to my 66 Mustang taking out an AR pistol. That's, all, that's, it. I, that's it. Just, hey, this is cool and this is how it works. As soon as I posted it, Facebook and Instagram put a COVID-19 <laughs> misinformation um, filter on my post. I said, I didn't mention the disease. 
I'm not talking about ivermectin. <laughs> it's me. Uh, it's my Mustang. It's somehow a, th a threat to, to, to America's health. So, and, and when, when people see that, they go, I mean, the comments, all the comments were less about the gun and they're saying, ha ha, look at Mark Zuckerberg. He's afraid of Seb's Mustang. So, you know, th this is how we win. People see that and they laugh. And as a child of those who escaped communist dictatorship, who suffered under fascist dictatorship, let me tell you this. They only censor you when you're speaking the truth. Mm. And the fact that they're censoring us means that, in fact, they are weak. If you are strong, if your arguments are strong, if you are truly popular and you don't have to steal elections, guess what? You're not afraid of us and you don't have to censor us. So, guys, revel in it. Push back and revel in the censorship because it means you're over the target. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, please tell us where uh, folks can follow you, both your radio show, your television yeah. show, and tell us a little bit more about your book and where we can pick that up as well. Yeah, so my website where you can see everything is sebgorka.com. That's S-E-B-G-O-R-K-A, sebgorka.com. The radio show is, you know, like you guys, I'm on Salem, 3 to 6 Eastern every single day, 300 stations across the country. We live stream on Rumble, so you can watch the video of the show rumble.com slash Seb Gorka. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. Um, and the book that you can get at, at, at my store, sebgorkastore.com, the latest one is The War for America's Soul. And it's really about the challenges we face, what it's going to take to win, and how you, every single one of your viewers and listeners, can be part of making us the shining city on the hill again. So sebgorka.com uh, and sebgorkastore.com. And I want to say, thank all of you. Please, guys, support the Nazarene Fund, support the Blessings Project, uh, save our allies. These guys are doing amazing work, and God bless you. Another incredible conversation, so many wonderful takeaways. I want to give you a few today, and this will be your situation report. First of all, as we began, we heard Dr. Gorka's story. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with his story, but an incredible story. It really helps us to understand why he views the world the way that he does. Uh, he talked about that moment where he realized that he needed to stand against one candidate and for another. When he really decided that he would begin to communicate conservative values and ideals in a much more public way, as he talked about making his first videos sitting in his car, uh, this for me is a lesson. A lesson that we need to be very introspective about what we believe in light of what's happening, and then we need to respond in a way that reflects our true values. So often we allow the world to pass us by without ever stopping and asking the question, why is this happening? What do I believe about what is happening? And how can I live in a way that is true to what I believe, true to my values? And to me, that's a great takeaway. Uh, the second thing, this was another conversation that we had, was about segregating into these, as he called them, ghettos. <laughs> segregating from the rest of the population. We used the example in the conversation about moving from mainstream social media platforms to other social media platforms. Certainly, I think we should be everywhere. But if we take ourselves out of the mainstream conversation, we lose our voice. We begin speaking to others who believe exactly what we believe, and in doing so, we lose our influence. We need to stay where we can have the most influence over the most folks, which might mean fighting back against shadow banning, fighting back against deplatforming and demonetizing, but we need to fight back, and we can only do that if we're in the fight. Great point. And then finally, and I love this, there's so much hope. <laughs> uh, there's hope when we look at even the media numbers. Conservative media is growing while left-leaning media is diminishing. It seems because of how it's propped up that it is front and center, but really more and more and more Americans are hungry for truth. And as Sebastian said, we need therefore to give them the truth. And to me, there's tremendous hope in that. Uh, that's your situation report for today. Many other points we could pull out, of course. Please go and listen to Sebastian Gorka's radio show. Watch his television show. Pick up his new book. You'll be blessed in the process. Thank you for joining me this week. Look forward to talking to you next.